Well, again, it's network. Uh, you know, Howie was a chance meeting, I guess. And he's so passionate about what he does. And he also is very networked within the, I mean, he's rather famous in Scotland. And, you know, he's done kilts for Sam and Outlander and stuff. And yeah, it really was a snowballing thing where I started with him and kilt makers within his firm. Welcome to another episode of Innovation Insights, where we dive deep into the minds shaping the future of industries through innovation, creativity, and groundbreaking research. We believe that innovation happens in all aspects of life. Today, we're thrilled to have a special guest, Dr. David LaRanger, a distinguished figure in fashion marketing, luxury, and design thinking. With nearly two decades of experience in the New York City apparel industry, Dr. LaRanger has worked on both the design and retail sides, collaborating with iconic brands such as Michael Kors, Target, Nordstrom, JCPenney, Gap Group, J. Crew and Cutter and Buck. His expertise also extends into luxury retail management, where he held pivotal roles at Bergdorf Goodman, Laura Piana, Barney's New York, Saks Fifth Avenue, and the transitioning into academia after a 17 year career in the fashion industry. Dr. Ranger has brought his vast industry knowledge into the classroom. As an assistant professor, he teaches fashion marketing, luxury, and design thinking courses, preparing the next generation of fashion leaders. His academic journey includes significant contributions as a faculty member at the University of Minnesota and Philadelphia University where he taught various courses from fashion and retail to international business, marketing, and design thinking. Dr. Loranger's research interests are as fascinating as his career, focusing on marketing, cultural apparel products, and generational consumption. His work has contributed valuable insights to the field and has been recognized with prestigious awards, including the 2019 International Textile and Apparel Association Intellect Publishing Research Award and the American Collegiate Retailing Association 2018 Best Paper Award. Today, Dr. LaRanger joins us to share his insights on innovation and studying cultural apparel and the future of fashion education, specifically the Scottish kilt. Dr. LaRanger, welcome to Innovation Insights. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. Good to join you. Oh, it's wonderful to have you here, Dave. Oh, <laughs> gosh. We yeah, have known each other for quite a while, and I was fortunate to uh, serve as your major professor and met you through your dissertation process. And you were actually the first doctoral student to finish the hybrid distance program for the apparel merchandising and design. A program at Iowa State University. So it's been a fun ride with you, David, and thank you for being here. You're still talking to me after all this time. You are you are welcome to come visit anytime. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> we have a lot of stories of some prep for conferences and uh, presentations that we'll say for another episode yes <laughs> <laughs> lots of edits oh so you've had such a remarkable uh, journey as a professional in the industry and working with high profile clients and industry brands and retailers to now teaching the next generation tell us about your industry experience and then how did you transition from industry into academia yeah i <laughs> As an aside, I always tell my students, let me say, let me show you Scatter My Ashes at Bergdorf Goodman, the documentary, and then you'll realize why I am the way I am. But I would have to say that I'd preface it by saying your network is everything. And my journey has been enabled 
through my network, including people like you, including Dr. Joe Hancock at Drexel, just really great mentors and friends that that become more than an industry contact or more than a colleague. Um, and so when I was in industry, I really felt like my career ceiling was being met and we all get those feelings now and then. And Bergdorf Goodman was a, I have to say, I went out on top, but <laughs> Bergdorf Goodman was a family. It was a great place to work. I still, when I go spend hours there hugging people and chatting, but I just wasn't fulfilled. I would say I'd gotten to a point where it became very mundane. And my wife had gone to school with Dr. Joe Hancock at Indiana University back in 19. And she reconnected with him on Facebook. So we met for dinner one night in New York. And you, it was like talking about our backgrounds, his at Gap and Target and mine and luxury. And Joe being Joe said, honey, you need to teach. We, he actually was consulting for LIM College for a program and said, let me connect you with someone there. And I started teaching a retail math class at eight in the morning before I went to the store. So I teach retail math and go into the store and I just loved it. And that's where I got hooked. It was the interaction with the students and this new feeling of value that your experience could be repurposed in a, another significant way and not something that was mundane. And yeah, so that, that was the beginning of it. And like when you, I feel like if you have a good network and you make this decision, you're passionate about it, opportunities just come up. So when my wife and I moved from New York to Philadelphia for her job, Philadelphia University had a opportunity and a connection through Joe again with Nyoka Wyatt at Philadelphia University. And that grew into a visiting position and then into a tenure track position. And then Minnesota happened with connections through Iowa State. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think it is like this path that just happened organically. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I love that you talk about the connections and because we can't do any of this on our own. Yeah, we stand on the, on the shoulders of giants and people who are willing to help us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, we spent quite a bit of quality time working through your dissertation topic. So it focuses on the Scottish kilt. Yes. So would you talk yes. about that? And what, when, first, what inspired you to pursue this topic too? I'll do another prefacing. Folklore is a huge part of the Scottish brand and these myths and stories that have evolved over the years add to this mystery and romance, like in High, uh, Outlander. <laughs> it's funny. For years, I thought I had Scottish ancestry and I thought I was at least a little bit Scottish because my maternal grandmother's name, her, her last name was Harvey. And my cousin Denise, who lives in Arizona, is an amateur genealogist, so she does her thing. And she contacted me on LinkedIn one time and said, "Could you should take a look at this. Maybe you can fill in some blanks from your part of the family. And as I clicked in, I, I always thought, gosh, I'd never be able to know my family, but a couple of generations back. And when I plugged in the information, my fi the ancestry went back on my father's side to the 1500s in Normandy. And then on my mom's side, it went back to England. So I actually was the enemy. So my family is really English. And but before I had that experience, this misguided idea of my lineage guided me with my wife Anne to Scotland for a trip. And she was thinking up fun things to do. So she found my now friend, Howie Nicholsby, who owns 20, 21st Century Kilts. We all know that Howie is a character. He's designed for Lenny Kravitz and Vin Diesel and Richard Grant. And we went to a shop and we're like, this would be fun. We're going to buy some kilts. And we started chatting as Howie is very good at getting customers to do. And he learned that I was an academic. and 
we started talking about the fact that there was this conversation in Scottish kilt making communities about potentially getting some type of certification or protection on their product, mainly based on PGI, which is protected geographic indication, which is through the EU, obviously now moot point with Brexit. But so I thought it was a really compelling topic and it was a topic that not only I could help a group of people who may felt disenfranchised a little bit, but also merged all these interests that I have, culture, business, design, semiotics. So it, it seemed to me like there was a lot of, um, gr I guess, um, ground there, you know, that I could cover and discover. Wonderful. And again, you know, how a connection can then help inform a whole line of research that you conducted. Would, would you talk a bit about your process for the research? How did you approach it? It's, and for me, I am a networker. You know, I always say to my students, go on my LinkedIn and there's 1500 LinkedIn connections. If you need a job, go through my LinkedIn and just DM someone, right? So um, uh, for me, it's really about that. It's about a network. It's about developing networks, telling stories, telling people stories. And mostly for me, phenomenology, like qualitative methods for me are just the way I am, I'm a people person. And I really think phenomenology is great because it's all about lived experiences. And I don't want to filter my participants. I almost want them to be there when whoever the consumer or the research is like, I want their voice to be right there, almost as if they're telling it, the story directly from their own mouth. And to me, it's also about documenting processes that might seem very obvious. And Joe Hancock and I have had these conversations before as colleagues why has nobody done a serious study on denim or what and which he's doing now or uh so, sort of like these very uh iconic industries and products and it's true like these these industries these sectors these handicrafts whatever have not been documented and they really should be documented documented because i just wrote a note here i said i want to really tell and have the people who are producers of extraordinary work and the guardians of extraordinary cultural heritage to be able to be d documented and to have a voice and to have people understand what they do. It's a little bit about, uh, I guess, illuminating certain parts of our culture that we take for granted. Right. And sometimes those pieces of our culture, culture go away and we don't document it. I'd seen a, a PBS documentary about shipbuilding. I think it was in Maryland. And there were old ship designers and shipbuilders who had a lot of knowledge, but the shipbuilding industry died out and they weren't able to perpetuate their knowledge to younger generations that they weren't interested in it. And then the knowledge just went away. And I think as researchers, part of our job is not only to analyze culture, but to document it. Yeah. I love telling those untold stories. And so why you mentioned that some of these stories are taken for granted. Why, why do you feel that is the case? It's funny when I teach students about dress and I said, you know, two thirds of your parents probably said, you're crazy to go study fashion. Why would, you know, like um, David Huey, who's the creative director at Bergdorf Goodman and Scatter My Ashes says, who would be crazy enough to study visual merchandising? <laughs> so there is a perception in culture because it is so ingrained. It's like linguistics in a way, you know, it's like language is so embedded into our culture. Dress is so embedded into our culture that we don't process the semiotics of I see a red light, I know it means stop, my foot goes down on the brake pedal to stop. That's just autonomic. And dress and linguistics are much like that too, where we take them for granted. Um, 
And yeah, I think it, it's just a part of life that we don't really think about. So we devalue it in a way. And it's so central to Joanne Eicher would say, um, you know, situating us in space and time, allowing us to understand reality, like our ontology, right? It's yeah. yeah. I don't know if that answered the question. Oh, <laughs> that is a, what a great example with the stoplight and how we, our automatic response to that symbol that we just take for granted and we take our clothes, our textiles for granted that we use every day. So that's really wonderful. Yeah. And in the class, in the intro to fashion class that I have, you know, I put up three pictures, put up a picture of a doctor, a police officer, and a pilot. And I say to the class, I'm going to prove to you that this is so embedded into your understanding of the world. Who's that guy? A doctor. Who's that guy? A cop. Who's that guy? A, a, a pilot. And I just put down the words and I said, well, how did you know? Well, it was because of the way they were dressed. And I said, then let's take it further. If you were, you got onto a plane, you're sitting in first class and a guy dressed as a doctor gets on and goes into the cockpit and the cockpit door closes and you start pushing away. I said, what would you do? And the students are like, I, I might get off the plane. <laughs> and I said, yes, because what did you do just by looking at that person? You not only identify them, but you make a judgment of their qualifications based on their dress. Right? <laughs> what, a great, what a great exercise with your students. So thanks for sharing that with our audience. Yes, I think most of us would be jumping off that plane pretty quickly. Uh, not as quick as I jumped off a plane when they said five bolts from the cargo bay door were missing. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's looking good. I, I might be getting off this plane and taking one tomorrow. <laughs> yes, yeah, we want all of our bolts on our plane screwed in. <laughs> I'll remember to bring my own bolts next time I fly southwest. <laughs> well, talking about flying, could you tell us about how did you? Collect your data and uh, tell the stories of these kilt makers. How, what was that process? Well, again, it's network. Uh, you know, Howie was a chance meeting, I guess. And he's so passionate about what he does. And he also is very networked within the, I mean, he's rather famous in Scotland. And, you know, he's done kilts for Sam and Outlander and stuff. And yeah, it really was a snowballing thing where I started with him and kilt makers within his firm. And then his dad owns a firm called Jeffrey Taylor, which is a chain of about five or so Highland dress stores in Scotland. And so I went up to West Lothian where their shop is, did some stuff there. Then his dad knew a person on the Royal Mile that owned a firm and they have a school. So I actually ended up interviewing people there and then they knew people up in the Highlands uh, that had a school up there. So I went up there. So really, yeah, it was all networking and it was a great participant pool. It was like the age range, the, you know, obviously most kill makers are women I was able to get male kill people from a lot of different types of experiential backgrounds. It was really cool. Excellent. So you went to Scotland and how long did you spend there interviewing kilt makers? It was two rounds. So oh. it was first round probably for about a week. I think it was five days. That was in Edinburgh. So I did yeah. all that research in Edinburgh. And then I came back and I think we had, that was like a pilot study. And then we analyzed and then I was like, okay, I'm more informed about this because I'm, we had a note on this, but gender issues came up that, you know, I, I wasn't aware that most female, most kill makers were female. And then some gender issues, disenfranchisement type things came up in the interviews. So I said, okay, let me go back and look at this more because PGI originally was the frame. And then these other significant things were coming up. And so I went back in the spring. I remember it had to be a quick trip and I went to the customs agent in, in Edinburgh when I flew in and he's like, 
you're only here for three days. What are you doing? <laughs> it's like you flew all the way from to, to Scotland from the U.S. for three days. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, that round was, again, some in Edinburgh, then taking the train, which is spectacular, up to Aberdeen, uh-huh. driving into the Highlands and interviewing in the Highlands and then going up to Inverness. Um, I, you know, just it, research. Oh, God, the travel, you know. <laughs> but it's it's spectacular. It's absolutely yeah. spectacular. And yeah, that really informed the study a lot more with, especially with the more organized kilt schools, because it revealed that there's this Scottish vocational qualification, which is an actual official training program that the Scottish government actually gives degrees for, but it has to be organized and affiliated with SVQ. Mm-hmm. Well, and that really speaks to the importance of the kilt within the Scottish culture to have training that is mm-hmm. internet supported. Would you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm. It's one of my favorite quotes from the study. Is, uh, you know, like a, a kilt isn't a skirt. It doesn't have construction. It doesn't have cutting or a pattern like a skirt, it's just one single eight, six to eight foot piece of cloth that's basically origami and stitched, right? Um, And it always has been that because the great kilts, the old kilts were just a piece of fabric that someone wrapped around themselves and belted. And that's where the pleats came from. And yeah, the SVQ, it, it is super important because a lot of the training was unofficial for a long time. A lot of training just happened where, and a lot of kilt makers have gotten into the line of work by happenstance. They lose their job and they're looking for a job and they meet someone and they just get into it. And the firms, you know, um, are, are good at training people. But what firms tend to do, which is interesting, is they disconnect skills, which I, I mean, they don't want people to come and train to know the whole process so they can't go start their own firm. So they actually have their training focusing on particular parts and they separate the parts so that someone can't replicate the process from beginning to end. So it's kind of like a pr- protectionist thing. So the SVQ is interesting because Obviously, the firms had input into the creation of the SVQ and kilt makers did as well. But what the SVQ does is it really formalizes the the training into specific parts, including the business side. So really, the, the whole training starts off with how do you fill out order forms? How do you balance books? It is like a business course, too. Mm-hmm. And then it proceeds to... How do you set up a workroom? What is the organization? What are the safety measures of a cutting room? And then finally you get into the actual nuts and bolts of learning the process of kilt making. And these are actual like um, college College level level. degrees that you're getting when you get the SVQ. SVQs go all the way up to, I think, a doctoral level. Oh, okay. Uh, Yeah. And I think we had a note in here about the kind of process, which is one of the kilt makers at the kilt school in the Highlands put it best. She said, you learn the basics and it's almost like reverse learning where the actual process you're learning by first doing alterations. So you're actually starting with the finished garment first and taking it apart and putting it and seeing the guts of it and then putting it back together, which gives the learner a really good idea of what the finished product should look like, what the construction yeah. is, and then going back to really specific things like stitching, getting your different stitches right, um, you know, learning how to measure people and translate that into chalking the garment because there there's no pattern, and I think that's where I that's where I diverge there. Uh, um, it, you know, there's no pattern. A skirt and a kilt are different because a skirt has a pattern and a kilt has no pattern. So literally what the kilt maker is doing is taking the measurements, recording them, key points of measurements, and then translating them on directly onto a piece of fabric and chalking that piece of fabric and then basically folding it up and stitching it. So 
it is a very different process that, you know, kilt makers are, kilt makers are not tailors. They're not dressmakers. There is a very unique process of making that garment, but very specialist. And to go back to our previous comment, so much more to reason to document these people in their process because it is so neat, right? Right. Well, I'm thinking about what you just said about there's not a pattern. It's not a skirt. So you're basically taking a rectangular piece of fabric and folding it up. Now, someone may think, okay, what's the big deal? It's a rectangle. You're just mm -hmm. folding it up to fit someone's body. But the fabrication that kilts are made from probably has some mathematical challenges. So could you talk about what traditional kilts are made from? And then we'll talk about some non-traditional fabrics that kilts are made from. And how does that fabrication make that a challenge that you're just, oh, let me just fold up some fabric and wrap it around the, my body. So there's a couple of things. So there is exactly what you said, the fit. As we found when we prototyped our kilt, that was part of the process too. And the dissertation was prototyping. And you kind of watch the kilt maker do it and you're like, oh, that seems pretty easy. And then you get into it and the shape to the body is, is very difficult to achieve because Think of a kilt with 32 pleats in it. And so if I'm off my measurements by an eighth of an inch, 32 times, that impacts the shaping a lot. I can't even do the math on that, but it, it probably is a few inches, I would think. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, eight inches or whatever. One element of it is that you're trying to shape this piece much like a corset. That's what they call it. It's like a corset for a man is up into the waistline, but the replication because of the pleats, the replication of having to be exact is super important because you're going to amplify if you're making even the slightest mistake in the shaping, right? Well, then the other piece of it is the set and that that's the actual pattern of the plaid of the tart. So on this chair, oh, you have a set and, <laughs> and so you can pleat kilts to the stripe or to the plaid. And if you see certain military kilts, for instance, when the pleats come together, you will see a defined sort of like matching color, mm -hmm. like almost like I was to pleat to the stripe, I might do it to this red or I might do it yeah. to this white, a lot of red and white down the back. Mm -hmm. Or I can get so that it seems like an, a continuous version of this, right? Mm -hmm. And so your math is really important because you have to figure out how to replicate either the pattern or the stripe, but then also figure in what the measurements are, the depth of each pleat that you mm -hmm. have to make to achieve that, plus the shaping. It's really complicated, <laughs> as I found out. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and should not be taken for granted. So the kilt makers are really mathematicians. Yes, there is a huge element of math. Uh, it's almost engineering, I would say. I would agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for disclosure, I have a background in pattern making. <laughs> yeah, and you know, to, with pattern making, it's like, okay, so if you're making a skirt, you can achieve that fit through right pattern or mm -hmm. darts or things mm -hmm. like that right mm -hmm. but this is so challenging because it's a three-dimensional it's not two-dimensional it's three-dimensional right yeah yeah and yeah thinking about that i was in high school i was a cheerleader and we had uniforms that were pleated skirts but they also had that shaping and i just remember always you know, a lot of my classmates had you know, a seamstress or a tailor someone make their skirts but or their mothers did but since i um had this large interest in fashion my mother was like well, you're make your own and i was wanting to do that anyway and yeah <laughs> and so those of you that an audience that have ever had that experience um 
just making a pleated skirt, you can see the challenges. But then, as Dr. Laurie Juris Dave was saying, with the plaid of the tartan, that just adds a whole other level. And then aesthetically, how do you want that to? So you did a great job. And thanks for sitting in a beautiful chair with a tartan. Yeah. <laughs> I think these were actually old, either Ralph Lauren or Brooks Brothers props. Oh, really? Uh, up in that auction. Yeah, <laughs> they weren't expensive. <laughs> so we got a good deal. <laughs> well, they're beautiful. It is perfect for this. Um, so. <laughs> oh, well, uh, you know, you're during your study, and you've touched on this some is that learning process that a kilt maker goes through and that it's a it's lifelong learning and there's a teaching philosophy of scaffolding could you talk about that and how that came through in your research yeah and it was interesting it, it we're always asked how research informs our teaching mm -hmm. and uh this really had a big impact on my teaching as well as like realizing that you have to take basic concepts to indoctrinate people into like uh, having them understand the principles that you're teaching them but then layer on top and increase the complexity as you go to get them to a master level yeah so um you know, uh, yeah, literally the teacher at the Highland School described it best. It's, you start with the basics, you start with the stitching and the essential stitches. And literally they make little samplers of stitches and they and in the SVQ, they get graded on those. So you can't go to the next phase of the SVQ until you master those stitches. And the stitches have to be tight. You know, it has to be done correctly. And, and there are also basting stitches and stitches for the canvas and things like that, because it is a canvas garment. And then there's a separate stage after that, where you just do sample pleating. So you're just working on pleating and just trying yeah. to do pleating and canvassing and then trims and buckles. And these are like the basic steps. And then at least this particular SVQ was you have to make five or six kilts, like five or six kilts before you even get anywhere near competent at making a kilt. And you're graded the whole way through on this SVQ. You know, the uh, again, you can't go to the next step of the SVQ until you master it. Oh, that's are symmetrical, but some plats are not symmetrical. They skew to one part of the repeat, right? Um, and that's a whole other thing. So you're learning pleating on balance plaids and then unbalanced plaids and pleating to the stripe and pleating to the set. And so as you go, you master those, what I would call basic, just to be competent and make it in kilt. But beyond that, one of the participants had a really interesting quote. They said, nobody, nobody, I said, oh, what does it feel like being a master kilt maker? And they said, well, nobody's a master. You're yeah. constantly learning. And yeah, but one of the, one of the students actually had characterized the teacher as automatic, that she had such a knowledge of kilt making. And I've known, I, one of the tailors at one of my places that I worked, I worked at a company called Solka in New York, and he could literally make a pair of pants just by taking exactly like a kilt maker, actually taking your measurements and chalking, didn't even create a pattern, chalked it down on the fabric cut it and so he made two pair of pants for me by hand but that's like the maestro level i would say mm -hmm. is um mm -hmm. you know you get to that point where you know the teacher there could obviously did measurements but everything is so automatic to her that she mm -hmm. can do it really rapidly and almost without looking the stitching everything mm -hmm. so that's kind of like the scaffolding is like that building of the learning and to more and more complex things you know yeah 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 and it, uh, it also relates to malcolm gladwell one of my favorite authors discusses those ten thousand hours that you need to put in to become an expert and it kind of relates to that that you need to put that time and that practice in and 
as you talk about making samples and, you know, repeatedly making garments, you know, you don't go to school and you make, you know, one kilt and then you're like, I can, I can go get a job and be an expert. And it, but that repetition and just fitting that time in to really learn. There's also like that haptic sense, I think. Yeah. You know, that connection haptically between what you're doing and then, and I'm not really a sewer, but I, when I did the prototyping process, I did get that sense of that haptic sense. Like I could see as you do this more and more, you get more and more savant at it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it comes automatic. That that does. Yeah. It's really cool. I want to go back to, you made a comment that the kilt is a canvas garment. Would you explain for our audience, well, what does that mean? Yeah. As a tailored clothing guy. So I, I spent a lot of my industry career in tailored clothing, but you know, uh, canvas is an internal component of a garment that gives it structure. A lot of times it's made out of horse hair or some type of coarse, maybe linen. And it, if you take apart, let's say a men's jacket, you will see that there is this internal component, this internal layer of fabric. As a matter of fact, if you pull a jacket and it's not fused, meaning the canvas is not glued to the outside uh, piece of fabric, you should be able to feel three separate pieces of fabric in there. And it's, and what's difficult about canvassing is that it's not just shoved into the inside to give it structure. The tailor actually has to sort of through basting it achieve some type of conformity and shape. Mm -hmm. And then as the person wears that garment, the canvas will become more supple and kind of, uh, adhere to them a little bit more and become their own, I think. So you're saying that the garments can be tailored or sculpted to the body, that round human body. So even a kilt is, I don't know, you're, I'm sorry, I'm just like all into this because I, you know, I love tailoring, I love pattern making and everything. I love that we are out here explaining this because it's easy for, you know, people to understand and then also just recognize that, okay, a kilt is just not a pleated piece of a fabric mm. it is mathematically calculated and then it's also conformed to the body with this understructure of canvas which and humans are you know are we're complicated in many ways and our bodies are complicated too it <laughs> is <laughs> it is yeah it's strange you know i mean even a kilt maker some people have, you know, I know from experience in tailored clothing, you know, like some people have a sloped shoulder or um, they have a longer sort of uh, arch in their back. So you have to reduce the collar or, and kilts are very similar to that. Mm -hmm. And they are alterable. They actually have an extra bit of fabric in them to be altered, let in, let out. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a piece of tailored clothing. Definitely. Absolutely. And I like how you mentioned the altering because part of the complexity of the human body is that it changes how throughout one's life touch. Yes, this is true. <laughs> I'm I mean more like this. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> well, that's another podcast, the changes of the human body and oh <laughs> uh, Yeah, another part of the aspect of the kilt is um, the quality of the kilt. And uh, one thing that we deal with in the pearl industry and fashion industry is um, quality of garments or um, ones that are maybe not truly made um, in an authentic way, but imported or so. Would you talk about that and what did you find in your research and also your travels in Scotland with basically knockoffs. This is, this is uh, the, the actual topic that started the whole conversation about PGI and the kilt making community, which was in Edinburgh, there is a pretty powerful family who are Indian, who came to Edinburgh and great entrepreneurs, um, you know, started touristy type shops on the Royal Mile. 
and through a lot of really hard work, own something like 35 stores on the Royal Mile, right? And it's not just selling kilts, it's selling, <laughs> I visited Edinburgh and just got this stupid mug. Now, <laughs> But, and, and we know the other interesting topic that connects with this is the English colonies, right? And the connection between colonization of India by the English and the increase of textile production in <laughs> India and, and you know, oh, sorry, my clock is going up, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and then, uh, kind of increasing production of garments in India. Now we know India is a major apparel production, right? And so uh, there is this whole complex of kilt making in India. And also don't forget Highlanders that went to India with the British armed forces and the people who were, I guess, conscripted into the British army, kilt making knowledge built up there as well. Mm -hmm. And so there is a pool of knowledge in India as well. Mm -hmm. But in order to hit their IMU, their price points, this particular family needs to produce and cut corners and do it in a industrial method, meaning uh, a lot of human hands don't touch the product that they're making. For instance, there are automatic pleating machines. So you can put the piece of fabric down on a pleating machine and it will just pleat, 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 pleat. It doesn't calculate anything and it doesn't match. And so this family that owns this chain of stores has built a really huge business in selling for us what they call tartan tat over there no. and so there is this conversation with the kilt makers but the kilt makers also acknowledge that there is a market for tartan tat they're much like there is a market for bergdorf goodman and macy's and costco apparel in our country mm. the tourist industry in scotland is the same thing so they don't really begrudge the i guess that sector mm -hmm. but they just don't like the fact that people who are uninformed about product quality mm -hmm. will come into their shops and say, well, you charge 700 for a kilt, but this other place on the Royal Mile charges 50. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a, so, so a piece of this is, yeah. as one of the firm owners said to me, is educating customers and a part of that is the selling ceremony is when somebody comes into your shop and says, it's $700 versus 50, you're educating them on what the differences are and the element, you know, I, I, this is a weird thing, but having been in the apparel business for so long, there is just some type of je ne sais quoi that comes from certain places in the world. Like we had a pant from a unnamed Italian maker that we took and sent to a maker in Brooklyn and the pant just did not translate. They did the pant, they took the pant apart and did the pant exactly the same way in Brooklyn. And it just did not translate like the Italians did. And that's where I go back to this haptic thing. Like there's some weird haptic thing yes. that is contained within like a pool of learners uh -huh. that you can't translate. And yeah, so the owners, the owners will educate and look, if somebody's at a certain price point, well, no, no shade on them. If they can only afford 50 bucks, that's cool. Well, it, they, if somebody wants a really mm -hmm. a rate garment, that's what the kilt makers and the firms educate them on Absolutely. and it, differentiating these different sectors of the kilt business, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that we, um, also deal with in the United States with, you know, between fast fashion and higher end luxury brands and everything in between. And so having consumers just be educated and know what they're getting and understand why price points are different oftentimes. It's not just that it's that people just want to charge more in some cases. There's um, some other factors that go into it. 
Yeah, Lee Edelcourt did, at yeah, Trend Union, did a great talk. Uh, I think it was like 2016. She called it the manifesto of the fan, uh, in the fashion industry. And she said one of the main points was that, you know, people in the industry are not educated on fabrications. And they, they I can I, watch certain TV channels, channels that shall remain nameless who sell products and they will call a woven a knit and a print a woven and, um, you know, and, and, and it is, it's a huge issue today with people not knowing what they're buying. Absolutely. And as academics, uh, it is really important that we maintain a high quality of textile science and textile history education for our students going out in the industry so they have understanding. And that is my soapbox. That is absolutely my soapbox. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's true. Like I said, in the manifesto, um, you know, that was one of the main points that she said is a huge issue with the fashion industry now is that there's been this devaluation of content knowledge, appreciation for expertise. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And we see it in academia. I mean, there's, um, yeah. we see it in academia. So yeah. Uh, I will jump off my soapbox now and Oh well, um you, you've mentioned that you made a prototype of a hill. How tell us about that process and how did that help inform your study and what was the kilt like and <laughs> why did you do it? <laughs> uh, 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 horrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I, I think uh, you had showed film about 20 mile boots or what, what was the name of the, um, yeah. right. Gosh, yeah. And yes. Yeah. And the point of that film, I think was, it was an art piece that where the boots told you a story while you walked around to them and the story varied compared to where you walked, right? So I really feel that you can't really empathize and understand an actual process unless you kind of have tried it. And so it was a walk a mile in my Nancy Sinatra boots. But yeah, so I, 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 uh, I actually found a book by another academic who is not a textiles and apparel academic who uh, is a kilt maker, amateur kilt maker. And it basically is a manual for how to make a kilt. She, by the way, when I initially talked to her about the idea for my dissertation said, that is the stupidest idea for a dissertation I've ever heard. But that's besides the point. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it really, uh, outlined in a kind of like a recipe fashion. I'm good at following recipes. Just ask my wife. Uh, so, but I threw a little curveball into it where I was like, okay, how he does non-traditional kilts. He does them in denim and leather. I'm not adventurous enough to do a leather kilt, but I said, let me try it in denim. And then 20 sewing needles later. I realized that denim is kind of a hard thing to sew. But yeah, I, I think what it really gave me empathy for was uh, the process of the, you know, calculation mm -hmm. of the, the measurements, the marking, that it's architectural. Yeah. It's like a blueprint. It's architectural. Yeah. And then the shaping. It fatuts me like I, it was so hard to get that shape. And it literally, when I describe like that eighth of an inch 32 times, that's exactly what I encountered was like this issue with the shaping, you well, know, th those were the big reveals to me, uh -huh. you know, about beyond the observation and the filming and all and the interviewing. Yeah. So, so when you were in the data analysis part of your research, how did the fact that you actually also made one of the products help you analyze that data? Um, I think by comparing it 
with the interview data of them talking about things that they things that make a quality kill to quality kilt in their opinion and then juxtaposing that with hearing and observing the kind of knockoff kilts the produced exactly. manufacturer industrial kilts produced in asia yeah. i would characterize them as so that that really informed my processes it really it led me toward i guess not quantifying as a salience i don't know what the right word is but like solidifying what those the what makes a real like a real scottish kilt a kilt and what makes a quality kilt a quality garment and then what are the hallmarks of um the process like right. the, not only from a production standpoint but from a quality standpoint mm -hmm. uh you know and even from a marketing standpoint from a customer service and yeah. um yeah. you know oh. uh, and standpoint from training but there were a lot of different kind of dimensions that revealed so you're saying that i'm waiting for product, it <laughs> if you're in merchandising or marketing or sales of a product being able to understand how the product is created and gaining that understanding through actually creating it which can happen in apparel pretty easily that helps you be better at your job. Yeah, you could say that. I had a colleague, no, I seriously had a colleague say to me, what was the quote? The quote was, oh, well, these, these are marketing students. They can't sew. And I'm like, I took home ec in like seventh grade and we had to sew. And I had never, I'd seen, maybe seen my mom's sewing machine, never used it and made a vest in home ec. And, um, you know, it's, you, it, so I'm making another analogy. So, you know, I was DJ on my college radio station and I was, I, had, I was like literally a few sessions into training on the radio station when my trainer didn't show up. So I called the, um, uh, the PD who was the, like the, one of the heads of the station. I said, Greg, um, you know, my trainer isn't here. And he, he's like, well, just, just do what you do. He, he kind of has a Southern accent. He's like, so just do what you do in cloudy. That was my nickname. It's like, just do what you do in cloudy. Just turn on, turn it on. You know how to do it. And then he called me later. He's, he's like, did the trainer show up? And I'm like, no, he didn't show up yet. And he said, well, you're doing great cloudy. Just keep doing what you're doing, man. Just keep going. And <laughs> that's, you know, and I have to say like trial by fire and actual, like an actual immersion, mm -hmm. uh, you learn real quick how to do something, right? Yeah. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, well, again, great examples of that. And I would say, yeah, you've had this, the career that you have because you have emerged yourself. Uh, you did learn garment construction early on. And so, hey, when you're at Bergsdorf, you could understand a well-made garment and mm -hmm. the quality of it because you understood the textiles, the construction, everything. And you're not going to be working in those types of areas if you don't understand that. And again, I will jump down off of that soapbox, but thank you for helping me get up on this, my soapbox okay. Well, you know, the, the piece of advice I would give to any, I always say to my students, work in a store, store because that gives you experience. But the other thing that helped me was befriending the tailors and observing them. So go have an espresso with the tailors when they make coffee in the afternoon and sit there and talk to them and watch them. Uh -huh. And that's really how kilt makers learn. They call it sitting to watch. Yeah, but uh, you know, though, like I remember Carlo at uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, just sitting watching him, and you know, they loved me because I was interested in what they were doing, and they, you know, they're like, "Do you want me to put coffee on? Like, let's have coffee." That would be a piece of advice that I would give anybody in the industry mm -hmm. um, if that's young. Um, you know, sit and watch. And, yeah. You know, I would say, you know, regardless of what industry that you're in, 
watch and observe, listen, take your headphones out and listen to the conversations that are happening around you. If you're in a, in a business suite or something, you know, just really just soak it all in. Um, yeah. 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 Like, buying appointment, like just observing a buyer negotiating me? or, me? Um, you know, any me? context you're in, like even even when I started in the industry at Textile Design Group, we were a, a swatch house that would sell vintage textiles to designers for inspiration. And, you know, I had these, we dealt with everyone. And just having that experience of sitting there and watching super experienced designers, almost merchandise of yarn dyed program. I had a one client from Land's End who could lay out a yarn dyed program and understand how that would be resized and recolored in his head, like just know how all that was going to sit. And just sitting there watching that is really super important for a young person. Yeah. 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 Oh, great advice. And there is so much more that we could go into. So I'm going to have you come back. Uh, the <laughs> resource that we need to talk to. And I was really hoping that we'd have a special guest pop in, like possibly someone from Outlander. <laughs> My cat did come into the room for a oh, little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, we'll work on this for, you know, the next interview that, you know, you but, might have. Sam in Connecticut. Connecticut. <laughs> Yeah, Sam <laughs> Connecticut would be fabulous. <laughs> uh, especially if Yolanda's here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For all of us, like, well, um, you know, if our audience would like to you know, get in touch with you, what would be the best way um, to connect with you for, as you mentioned, networking and things like that? Yes, that would be LinkedIn without a doubt. Oh. So they should feel free to LinkedIn me. I'm also on the Sacred Heart University website. So sacredheart.edu and we have links on there as well. Okay, fabulous. And we'll make sure that we provide links um, as uh, the podcast rolls out and our social media. So now we come to the question that we <laughs> ask every guest. How do you define innovation? I think it, an element of it is doing what has not been done, never meeting the status quo, never being satisfied with the status quo, but almost losing, unlearning what you've, so I always say, I, I, you know, when I teach my innovation course, I always use Yoda as an example, and I use Luke Skywalker trying to raise the, um, X-Wing fighter out of the swamp. And I think it was in the Empire Strikes Back. And Yoda says, you must unlearn what you have learned. And I think that Yoda is my, you know, along with you is my sensei for innovation because, you know, it is, it's about unlearning what you have learned because you are, we are all so pre-programmed with systems that, you know, from our learnings in the past that in order to deconstruct the way we have to deconstruct to be able to move forward and innovate right yeah so oh great great answer yes <laughs> oh you know it's just it's been wonderful to have you here and um again truly we'll have to have you back but what great insight to um you know a garment that has such cultural value for people globally, but is also probably underestimated in the amount of thought and processes that go into it. And then how you have um, told the story of um, kilt makers that hasn't been told. Thank you. Yeah. And I will just uh, let everybody know that UNESCO is actually starting a, a conversation about some type of certification for kilt making. It's very early, but 
there is kind of, I, I forget how they characterized it, but there is a conversation going on. Oh, wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I did not realize yeah. that. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up today's conversation on Innovation Insights, I really want to extend a heart felt thank you to Dr. David LaRanger and your profound insights and experiences within the fashion industry in New York City and merging your experiences in the industry with academia and sharing that uh, with your students who are truly lucky to have you as such an inspirational um, faculty member in their lives. We bring such rich research and experiences uh, to our field and, and a way of providing some really thought-provoking um, actions for uh, consumers and students uh, as they uh, navigate the fashion industry and the apparel industry every day. So uh, again, thank you, Dr. Larranger, for joining us today. Thank you. And for your significant contributions. I am Dr. Yolanda Sanders. I am signing off until next time. So keep innovating, keep dreaming, keep making a difference.